And this is my buddy's Browning Satori 12 gauge. And uh, I'm going to freshen this up for him. I mean, uh, this is probably the most used and abused Browning Satori I've ever seen in my life. And uh, I've seen thousands of these things uh, out in the field, in the gun shop, um, at the range. And uh, man, I mean, look at the stock. It is just chewed up. Looks like it's been through a blender. It's got a crack in the forend. You know, look at this bluing. Just wore down to nothing, basically. Look at the barrel right here. It is so scratched and gouged up. I mean, bad. They're just bad gouges everywhere in the metal. Um, this trigger is super gritty and nasty. And I'm assuming that's because it's got a lot of dirt and gunk in it and possibly even a lot of rusted components in it. So, you know, I need to completely break this gun down and freshen it up. And uh, what my plan is, is to completely strip and refinish all the wood, uh, repair the crack in the foreign and do the same there. And uh, for a finish on the gun, if this was my gun and I used it this hard and I was going to refinish it, I'd probably uh, sand down all the scratches and gouges out of the metal, and I'd probably Cerakote the whole thing. But he wants it blued, so I'm just going to blue it. And then, uh, you know, of course, I'm going to fix this trigger and clean up everything inside. But uh, I actually like to see guns abused like this. I mean, I like to see them used. I mean, that's what Browning made this gun for. So I actually like to see guns used like this. And to him, this gun has a lot of history, and it's been his reliable go-to upland gun. So I'm going to freshen it up for him. Okay, and I have this shotgun broken down into its basic component parts here. And, uh, you know, I'm going to further break the receiver and everything down right there to do a deep cleaning on it, too. Well, I cleaned up all those scratches and deep gouges with various different grades of uh, sandpaper. And uh, this barrel's uh, about ready to blue need to clean it up really good with acetone put on my rubber gloves clean it up good with acetone and then uh, prep it for uh, bluing and basically I'll put it in a jig or a vise and heat it up real good with the heat gun and then start the bluing process with uh, Brownells Oxford Blue Before the first coat of Oxfo Blue is applied, I get the metal surface pretty hot, but not so hot that you can't touch it. This really seems to open up the pores in the metal and lets the blue soak in. When you apply the first coat, I like to use cotton swabs saturated in bluing solution and put, put the first coat on pretty heavy. I repeatedly go over the dried areas until the product stops flashing off. Then when this process is done, I'll uh, let the bluing sit for a minute, and then I'll wipe the surface dry. After the initial coat of Oxfo Blue is applied to a hot surface with a soaked cotton swab, I really like to change tactics on subsequent coats. You know, I'll lightly... Heat up the surface of the metal with a heat gun to where it's just warm to the touch. And I'll apply the bluing solution with a cotton patch by vigorously rubbing it in. You know, if it starts looking streaky at all or blotchy, I'll uh, degrease a piece of 4 out steel wool. And then I'll, uh, I'll dip it in the bluing and work the streaks or blotching out. You know, some people prefer to do all of their subsequent coats after the first coat with 4 out steel wool. But just remember to degrease the wool and change out the wool frequently after it darkens up. After you apply it, let each coat sit for about 30 or 40 seconds 
and then wipe it down with a uh, with a wet towel. You know, then burnish the surface very lightly and repeat the process over again. Well, this is six coats of Oxfo blue. You know, of course, carefully buffed out with four aught steel wool between coats and the uh, metal high, slightly heated up before I applied the bluing. But uh, you can also see the receiver right here. This was almost completely bare metal when I started, and that's starting to look pretty good. So I think maybe I'm going to go for maybe two more coats and do eight and get this to a really dark natural looking finish here and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, finish it up so the bluing's done and that turned out wonderful got the internals all cleaned up put back together got the trigger smoothed out on it but I ran into a problem to try to get this finish off down to bare wood and man just nothing's happened in there. I'll tell you what. <clears throat> these uh, Type 1 or Series 1 Browning Satori's. You know, people say they are basically the epitome of quality for the whole Satori line. You know, these uh, Type 1 uh, long bottom tang guns are pretty much known to, even though they didn't have any fancy engraving or anything on them, they're pretty much known for having the best quality, best fit and finish, and best uh, attention to detail. And with these stocks, it's obvious they didn't do the mass-produced rifle thing where they just hang up a damn piece of wood and spray it with varnish. I mean, this is a real finish job they did on these stocks. And I could tell... Because it's so hard to get this finish off. And uh, by the way, this is a 1976 gun. And this is the uh, 12 gauge Hunter model. So, I'm going to keep at it. Putting on another coat of citrus strip. Man, this. Old finish is hard to get off of this. You can see the citrus strip doing some work here. So as a lot of you know who have experience freshening up old shotguns, the uh, finish that Browning puts on these at the Morocco factory is some of the hardest finishes in the whole firearms industry to strip. I mean, <laughs> some of these Browning shotguns seem almost impossible, but these uh, Type 1 and pre-Type 1 Satori's are the hardest of the hard to remove the finish on. I mean, they really put the finish on these things strong. And uh, I've already did three treatments of citrus strip. And uh, the finish is almost gone, but you can see on here there's still a lot of dark areas. And I definitely don't want to sand on this checkering. This checkering's very old. Like I said, this is a Type 1 Satori made in 1976. And uh, this checkering's really worn down. So I uh, definitely don't want to sand on this or scrape on this. I want to... Uh, chemically remove all this finish with uh, with a good stripper so uh, I'm going to uh, at this point I'm going to put on another application of citrus strip and uh, try to target these darker areas right here and uh, we'll get started on that okay so uh, I got all of the finish off of these and uh, actually every last bit so um, I'm going to tape up this checkering and uh, start sanding on this. I'm going to start with 100 grit and probably work my way up to 400 grit on this. And then uh, start uh, slowly applying my true oil on it and letting it dry. 
sand between layers of that and uh, you know as a last step I'll peel the tape off of all of the checkering and uh, I'll start working on the checkering so it's uh, time to start sanding and one step I didn't show yet is that I did steam out all the uh, the really deep dents that were in this stock especially towards the butt end right here um, basically I'm sorry I didn't get that on film but uh, it's the common method of using a wet towel and uh, uh, a regular clothes iron and uh, it works pretty good once you get all the finish off and everything so always take the dents out before you start sanding on the stock before I get too far I want to show you something else I did um, I went ahead and replaced this recoil pad this old recoil pad, and I believe it's aftermarket, this is a Packmire. the one that was on it, it is just hard as a freaking rock, and the plastic backing's cracked in a couple of spots, and check that out, somebody wallowed the screw holes out, and that's just really unsightly, so, you know, I went ahead and replaced it with this Packmire, and this is a Packmire medium size, uh, grind to fit. And, you know, I basically uh, shaped it to the stock using my belt sander and uh, went over it with grit all the way up to 800 to smooth it out. And this will look really good once I get all this finished. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and take this off and it's uh, time to start staining. Okay, so after I removed the butt stock on there, I decided to do a little bit of finish sanding on this. And... <laughs> I actually ended up going all the way down to a thousand grit on this. You know, uh, I was going to stop at maybe 600, but you know, I, I went, uh, uh, 100, 150, uh, 250, 400, 600. And then, uh, after I got the butt stock done, I went 800 and then a thousand. And let me tell you, this thing is just so smooth, so incredibly smooth. So it's definitely time to do uh, one last wipe and dry with uh, some mineral spirits. And then uh, we'll get to uh, putting some true oil on this baby. Okay, now it's time to uh, start treating with true oil here. And basically what I'm going to do for this first coat is I'm going to mix some of this true oil about 50-50 with... Uh, with some mineral spirits to thin it out and then I'm gonna rub it in with my finger a really thin light coat this first coat needs to be super super thin and uh, basically you're gonna go with the grain you know remember whether you're scraping or sanding or applying oil to the stock you always go with the grain so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, make a little mixture of this and start the first coat And that's my mixture of uh, true oil and mineral spirits. And uh, you can see it's a, just going to dip my finger in that and start rubbing. And a if you sanded it really smooth, like this stock, I went over it with a thousand grit, a little bit of true oil is going to go a long way. And this is honestly what your first coat should look like. Very, very thin. Just enough to change the color on it a little bit darker. And uh, time to let that dry. And to give you a little reasoning as to why on my first application of finish, I use a mixture of uh, mineral spirits and true oil. I'm basically thinning the true oil. And the reason I do that is because even though I sanded this down to a thousand grit, um, this wood grain is still a lot more porous than you think. And uh, by putting on a th really thin layer of thinned out oil on my first application, basically I'm allowing that mixture, especially the mineral spirits, to kind of soak in and permeate down into the pores of the wood. And then that uh, mineral spirits will evaporate, will dissipate, and uh, leave the oil in there. So 
it's basically an important step to thin out and put a very thin uh, coat as your first coat. And then uh, when this dries, I'll hit it with 4 aught steel wool. And then I'll do one more um, application with the mixture of mineral spirits and true oil. And then when that's done and I sand it down from that point on, I'm just going to be using straight true oil. But uh, it's important at first to thin out your finished mixture and really let it soak down into the pores. And remember, you don't want to go really thick in your application with the first layer because um, in order for the mineral spirits to flash off, you also need air. So you don't want such a heavy covering on here that it allow you know that it uh, it doesn't allow the finish that soaked down into the wood pores to dry out. So you want that to happen. Just finished with uh, coat number three on this. So I don't know, man. Probably about uh, at least five more coats. Maybe even six or seven. Also, when you're applying your oil onto these stocks, you want to be sure you're working in a pretty sterile environment. I mean, I work in a room where there's hardly any traffic. That way, dust and pet dander or hair or anything like that isn't stirred up into the air because any dust or hair or any particles floating around in the air will stick to this finish like like Velcro. I mean, it's almost attracted to it. So uh, make sure you're working in kind of a sterile environment and set, you know, set this up to dry in a room where um, there's not going to be a lot of traffic. Also, another thing I highly recommend, wear either short sleeve shirts or roll your sleeves up. I know in my house, I have a big German Shepherd, I have a Chihuahua, I have a few cats, and I always have pet hair on my clothes. Always. So, you know, roll those sleeves up or wear short sleeves so it doesn't, hair doesn't fall off your clothes and contaminate your project. Okay, so the finish is pretty much done. And now it's time to address the checkering. Um, before removing this tape, what I'm going to do is I'm going to trace around the edges of the checkering border with uh, an X-Acto knife very lightly. You know, this is to prevent the finish around the checkering from peeling back or chipping when I remove the tape. Now it's time to uh, add a base coat of true oil into the checkering. And uh, you must apply this base layer very thinly and sparingly so you don't fill in this checkering too much and ruin the whole job. I start by mixing uh, true oil with mineral spirits again, a 50-50 mixture. And uh, I'm going to lightly work this in with an old toothbrush. Okay, so after applying this base coat really lightly down into the checkering, let it soak in for 24 hours or more and let it uh, completely dry before moving on from this step. So although this old checkering is slightly worn, it's not so bad that uh, the diamonds are really screwed up on it. So I'm going to uh, slightly repoint the checkering with uh, my favorite little riffler file right here. You know, if the checkering on this was really bad, I'd normally put the stock in a jig and uh, recut every line again with a single line cutting tool. 
But uh, recutting existing checkering is a tedious process that I really, really hate doing. Fortunately for this project, I believe that a little work with a good riffler file is pretty much all that's needed to make this checkering pop again. For this job, I'm going to start with my trusty Grobit number 131 riffler. The 131 is the best riffler I've ever used for checkering touch-ups, and I highly recommend it if you can get one of these. But honestly, for the real amateur with no experience uh, handling checkering, don't even attempt to recut or repoint the checkering at all. You know, at most, maybe I just redefine the borders around the checkering with the appropriate riffler and call that good. After repointing the checkering, I worked in another really thin coat of uh, true oil mixed 50 50 with mineral spirits. When you're applying finish to the checkering, less is always better. Another thing you need to remember is that when you're dealing with a lot of these old guns or even a lot of European guns, you'll notice they have these very thin flathead screws in them that require a special screwdriver. I really don't recommend that you grind down a normal screwdriver in order to make it fit in there. It's best you buy the right screwdriver, a good hollow ground one. I know for this Satori, all the screws on this took a Forster number 10. And uh, that's the correct tool for a job like this. You know, don't... Uh, I've even seen guys try to wallow out these screws with a Dremel, so these screw slots with a Dremel, so they can uh, get a standard screwdriver in there. But don't do that. Just get the right tools for the job. Like I said, for this old Browning Satori, everything was taken apart with the Forster number 10. So now we're going to test this trigger out. This was a five and a half, five and three quarter pound trigger before and it was super gritty but uh, when I got in here there was actually a lot of rust covering some of the trigger components and a lot of crud in there and uh, I didn't even do a trigger job on this thing I just cleaned it up and got rid of all the rust and lubricated it properly and uh, let's see where we're at now you could see we're at a four pound trigger now. That's pretty good. Nice, crisp, even four pound trigger. So I'm happy with that. And uh, there's a few little touch ups I want to do on this thing before it's finished out, but uh, I'm pretty happy with it. 